Well, hello everyone again. You know what? I really appreciate you coming to our website and also appreciate those of you who let others know about it as well. Have you deeply, truly repented of all your sins in a godly repentance? If we don't repent, then our sins aren't forgiven and we will perish. Jesus said that. If we truly repent, our, bright is, our, our future is bright. Our bright is future too, I guess. <laughs> anyway, what I'm getting at though is John the Baptist came preaching repentance. Jesus came preaching repentance. In Matthew 4, 17, when he began his ministry and all through his ministry and, and beyond, he wanted the apostles to be preaching about repentance as well. Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, you may feel you've repented. I hope you'll listen to the teaching anyway. I came to want to really deeply look into it myself some months ago until now. And I've learned a lot. I've learned that I was not uh, fully looking at everything I should have, the way I should have. <clears throat> So I began to look at this much more carefully and when criticized for eating and fellowshipping with known sinners, yes, that's what our Savior was doing, spending time with known bad people, okay, and he said this, Matthew 9 verses 12 to 13, when Jesus heard that, he said, those of you, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. When I was working my way through college, I thought of something humorous just now. In England, I was a painter for the first year and a half or so. And we used to say to one another, repaint, you thinner. Repaint, you thinner. But anyway, that was a, bad, a joke, but maybe a bad joke. But repentance is not a joke. Repentance is very, very serious. Luke 13, verses 1 to 5, uh, people came and asked Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had chopped up and mingled their blood and bodies in with the sacrifices, and also the Tower of Siloam that fell and killed 18 people. And he said, if you don't repent, you will also likewise perish. So it's a very, very serious topic. Because if we don't repent, that means we're not acknowledging our sins before our Redeemer. We're not accepting Christ as our Savior. And we're still living in our sins or still in our sins. And we have to pay the death penalty ourselves. Christ's blood will only cover the, the sins of someone who has properly, deeply repented. The Bible speaks of godly repentance and speaks of worldly repentance. You probably heard sermons on this. I promise you, you're going to hear some things today you may not have always heard. I, maybe not, but, but we'll see. But anyway, there, there, there's godly repentance, and we're actually told, which I'll cover in part two, much more of the godly versus worldly repentance. The worldly repentance leads to death. The godly repentance leads to life, eternal life. So uh, worldly repentance, just saying you're sorry, having some remorse, but not doing anything to change it, that uh, is not going to be seen as repentance. You might have said, oh, I did, I repented. So welcome, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm the host and uh, founder of it. And I am also a repentant, reforming sinner, as I hope all of you are. Now I'm God's son, as I hope many more of you are God's sons and daughters. And I really want to live God's way. Uh, I, I still have to fight the carnal nature I have. I'm trying to get the divine nature to be much more active in me, much, much more. 2 Peter 1.4 1, says we have this divine nature. We can defeat, we can defeat the carnal nature if we walk in the Spirit. Galatians, I think it's 5.16 says walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So we can defeat that. I'm going to talk about that also in part two. This is a foundational sermon first, so we need this one first. We need part one before we go to part two. So... Much, much more coming on that. Now, Jesus continued to make repentance a top topic even after his resurrection. Luke 24, verses 46 to 47, he says to his disciples after his resurrection, 
Thus it's written, thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins, they go together, at least godly repentance ends in remission of sins, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, starting in Jerusalem. I think repentance means a lot to the Son of God and to God himself, to God the Father. And so let's really look into it. Of course, this preaching did, did continue. On the day of Pentecost, the people were pricked to their hearts, it says, when Peter said, you have killed the Messiah, you put him on a tree. And they were pricked in their heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? So in Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, first word, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There were thousands of people there. This was no longer in a house, in a room. If it, you know, this was now, they baptized 3,000, so thousands heard the message. Not all of them got baptized probably, so thousands were listening to this. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice he doesn't say, let all of you be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It seems like that was what they were told to say in Matthew 28, verse 19, but we now know that was added by Constantine, because in every single instance, without exception, when the disciples and Philip and the apostles baptized people, they always did so just in the name of Jesus. So be aware of that. So if I baptize anybody, that's what I'll be doing, baptizing you in the name of Jesus. Now, if you look up the word repent, repentance, repented, you'll see how this topic came up a lot in the early church's teaching. In Acts 5, verse 30, 31, Peter's explaining that God wants to give repentance to us and um, he leads us to repentance. In Romans 2, 4, it says that. And uh, so our very ability to repent is from our loving God. Here's what Peter said to the council who didn't like him very much, wanted to kill him, frankly. And uh, the council wanted to kill Peter. In Acts, and, and the apostles, Acts 5, verses 30, 31, the God of our fathers, the God of our fathers, that's God the Father here, raised up Jesus. So the one who raised up Jesus was God, God the Father. And he's the God of our fathers, also it says here, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance. I looked that up. It really does mean to give repentance. You might think it means to give forgiveness. No, it was to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So God actually gives repentance. Even when uh, Peter later on was talking about the miracle of, of the calling of Cornelius, the centurion, the Gentile centurion, and how he, he and his whole family were all baptized, and they were all Gentiles. When he was recounting the story, the next chapter over, Acts 11, verse 18, the incident is Acts 10, I believe, but here in Acts 11, when they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted, given, gifted to the Gentiles repentance to life. God wants us to repent so badly, <clears throat> so much, that he's willing to give it to you and to me. To give it to you and to me. God does not delight in punishing us. Many verses say that. So he leads us to repentance and then gives us repentance, kind of pushing us in there as we respond, which in turn opens the door to his Holy Spirit and into his very kingdom of God. It's a wonderful thing, repentance. I think we tend to think of it in negative terms. Ooh, I got to repent. Repentance restores the relationship with God. Repentance is beautiful to God. So keep that in mind. 2 Peter 3.9. I'm going I'm to read this one out of the International 
standard version. The Lord is not slow concerning about his promise, as some people understand slow, slowness, but is patient with you. He does not want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to repent. Now, part two, I'm going to be talking about those of you who feel you're too bad. You've done too many bad things. You're just such a bad person and you keep doing bad things. God certainly doesn't want me. I, I won't make him and his group look good. So he, I'm not even bother repenting because will he forgive even someone like me? You say to yourself. Wants everyone to repent. Second Peter 3, 9. He doesn't want anyone. 2 Peter 3, 9, anyone to perish. So he grants repentance, leads us to repentance. No matter how bad you've been, he wants you there. If you repent, you got to repent, though. If you truly repent first, he wants you in the kingdom if he's calling you. No matter how bad you've been or I've been in the past. Everyone's included in the word everyone. Da, right? But some people think so-and-so, and I can name names in history and all that. So-and-sos are so bad. There's no way God would grant them repentance. What does everyone mean to you? What does everyone mean to you? So God is seeing repentance as a very, very good thing. It opens the door to life eternal with God, and he's happy to do it. Repentance, defined in its simplest form, it's confessing your sins to God, being very sorrowful about having sinned, having broken his law. You feel remorse. Your heart's broken. You may even be crying or weeping. It doesn't stop there, though. That might just end up being worldly remorse if it stops there. The Greek and the Hebrew for the word repent both have very much to do with the concept of turning, turning around, turning to God, turning back to God. And obeying him. And yes, there are verses that say to confess, of course, to God. And verses like James 5, 16, that even tell, tells us to confess our sins to one another that we might be healed. Who's doing that, though? I know one or two who are. 1 John 1, verses 6 to 9. You've got to have this in a, in a uh, sermon on repentance. If we say we have fellowship with him and continue to walk in darkness, we lie. Do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, Christ is the light. He's the rock. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and the light. He's all of those. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, not cleansed, it's ongoing tense, cleanses us from all sin. Yeah, even those, the really bad ones that you or I might do or have done or will do if we're not very, very careful about watching that human nature. If we say, I mean, really, when we really repent, the really bad stuff needs to go and not be repeated. We still will sin. Don't get me wrong. But hopefully we're not murdering, robbing banks, committing adultery, doing the really big, ugly stuff. Hopefully those are all gone. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All, all unrighteousness. And verse 7 ended by saying cleanses us from all sin. And then if you kept on going to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he becomes our advocate, defending us, standing up for us in the courts of heaven. So God really, once he calls us and gives us his Holy Spirit and leads us to repentance, he's there with us. And no one's going to be, take, be able to be taken out of his hand or out of his father's hand. John 10, 28, 29. Nobody, nobody. The only one who probably can do that actually is ourselves. If we just somehow go nuts and crazy and and uh, decide we don't want any part of this. We, God does give us free moral agency. But otherwise, nobody can take us out of God's hand. 
then repentance does include being very, very sorry for the sins committed. And we ask God to forgive us. Our hearts are rending. And then we ask God to help us to be committed to a new way of life. Give us the power and the strength. You know, deliver us from the evil one. You know, part of the so-called Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I believe it's the real intent, not just from evil, but from the evil one. So we ask God to help us. It's all part of repentance. Father in heaven, I can't. I just can't seem to resist uh, sometimes being mean to people or having bad thoughts or lustful thoughts or hateful thoughts or whatever happens that are wrong, that are unrighteousness. And you go to God and you say, please, I need help. And we turn to God. We return to God. We spend time in prayer. We spend lots of time in his word. We fill our minds with the good stuff. We walk in the spirit. And then we won't find, we'll find that on those days, that I, I do, that on the days that we walk in the spirit, keeping constant contact throughout the day, 7, 8, 10, 20, 30 times a day with God the Father and Jesus Christ, the bad stuff doesn't really come up. It doesn't. It's when we slack off on that and start putting more time into things of the flesh, into our computer, into social media, into whatever it takes up your time. Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is. You will start to be fed by the world. And that will become more and more dominant and you'll have more and more to repent of. That's what I found. But when I seek God, spend much more time in prayer and Bible study, and even listening to the Bible when I'm driving or getting things done around the house, the audio Bibles, which we have so handily free, I find that I'm a lot stronger. Okay, we're in the end times, and we are told to be turning back to God, like the prodigal son in Luke 15. Luke 15, the last part of the chapter, verses 11 to 31, this guy was really bad. The Bible says he squandered his entire inheritance on drunkenness and parties and whores and just wild living, debauchery, really brought the name of his family down to the mud. And yet when he came home and his father saw him afar off, girded up his robe, ran to meet him. I love the song, by the way, When God Ran. I'll try to make a note to put that in the, in the notes a link to it, When God Ran. If you haven't heard the song, I love that song. When God Ran. I can't listen to it without tears in my eyes. Because that's my story. And it's your story too, perhaps. For many of you, it's your story. I, re I recommend you notice how happy the father was to have him back home again. Let's party. Let's get new clothes on him. Sandals on his feet. Turban on his head. Ring on his finger. He is my son who is dead. He's come back to life again. Let's rejoice. There's more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who need no repentance. That's in Luke 15 as well, I believe. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Now in Joel 2, Joel is talking about end time prophecies. There's a big army coming and they're demolishing everything in their wake. They're leaving the, uh, what, what they're coming to looks like the Garden of Eden. By the time they go through it, it's all wilderness and demolished and destroyed. A prophecy of what's going to happen. <clears throat> and in Joel 2, end time, we're end time people. It's talking to us. Joel 2, verses 12 to 16. Therefore, says Jehovah, turn to me. Not to social media. Not to more and more time just watching the news. Not to more and more new movies. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting. When you deeply repent, maybe take a day to fast. With weeping, with mourning, rend your heart, tear it apart, rip it open. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him and a grain offering and all that. <clears throat> Continues in verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. 
call a sacred assembly. Gather everybody. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, the nursing babes. Everybody's got to repent is what he's saying. Will you heed this? Let the bridegroom go out of his chamber, the bride from her dressing room. Even if you're getting married, get out here and repent instead, God is saying. So this end time message is whatever you're doing now, stop. Go repent. Nothing is more important for you than being right with God, having your sins forgiven. To the last church of the seven churches, the church of Laodicea, <clears throat> Christ is pictured as knocking on his own door. He's the door in his own house to people who aren't opening the door to him. Maybe they're not home. Maybe they're dirty and ashamed to open the door. Maybe they're naked. Poor, blind, and naked, I think it says about them. And so you don't open the door to someone if you're naked. And so Revelation 3, read the end of it to, about Laodicea. His message is very clear to them. In verse 18, as many, verse 19, I think it is, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous, because they weren't zealous, they were lukewarm. Be zealous and repent. I'm at the door. To the Philadelphians, he says, I'm coming soon. Here he's saying, I'm right here, I've arrived. So this is very end time. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and dine with him. And he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. So if we repent and overcome, even the Laodiceans do pretty well in the end. Many of them will have to go through great tribulation, though. Now, something that comes up a lot of times, does a truly repentant person still sin? I've heard ministers tell people, you can't have repented because you did something again. You sinned again. All my life I've heard that, that once we're truly repentant, we stop sinning. One said, repentance is a commitment to stop sinning, a direct quote. Repentance is a commitment to stop sinning. I guess in a way it is. When we repent, we're telling God, I don't like what I did and I don't want to do sin again. So we're committing to living a new life, true. But I think it leaves the idea for, for everybody that when we do slip up, when we do sin, uh-oh, I didn't really repent. Right? Sure, many of you have heard that too. And yet I guarantee you that every single person on this planet, every married one too, everybody, including the ministers who say, if you ever repeat a sin, you haven't rep repented of it. Every single one of them still sin, even repeatedly. Every single one of them still sometimes break the Sabbath, sometimes gossip, sometimes covet, sometimes lust, sometimes all kinds of sins. Many times, more than once. You and I still do. And remember Paul, the Apostle Paul said, yes, even I still do the things I don't want to do. He said it twice in Romans 7. Are any of you more righteous than Paul? The problem is that rarely do I hear any minister admit that he still has to fight sin or confess some of his own weaknesses and temptations and attitudes. I've heard a minister recently who does a lot of that, maybe too much of it, but, but it does help you identify that he knows what being human is, is like. He knows what being real is like. I think people like to feel their preacher is far more righteous than most or than they are. But Paul was not above admitting that that which I hate, I still do from time to time. Now, let's make a point here because Jesus told Peter. Peter had come to him. Let's read this in Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22. <clears throat> Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? Or have, oh, and I forgive him. Up to seven times. Peter was thinking, pretty, thinking he was pretty righteous, pretty good to say seven times. 
Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, up to 70 times seven, 490 times. Many translations say 77 times. Either way, it's a way lot more than seven. And then he says also, and I'm going to talk about this, why I'm making this point, Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. It doesn't say, unless he's just a minor. If it's a real big sin, you don't have to forgive that. It's a minor one, though, you do. No, no, no. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and says seven times, returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. I know dozens and dozens of ministers who if I came to them seven times in a day with the same thing and asked forgiveness seven times, telling them I've repented again, but I've done this thing against you, and I, again, please forgive me again, many, many, many of them will say, no, I, you're not repenting. You keep doing it. Jesus said, if he comes back to you seven times in the same day, in a day, and says, I repent, you got to forgive him. You know why he's saying this? Because he knows that this is what he and Father do to us. That he, they have to forgive us of sins that are sometimes the very same sins. Might be just being careless with the Sabbath, or being careless with your words, or being mean, or being a gossip. May not even be the big, big, big ones. But over and over and over, God has to forgive us. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our debts, as we forgive our debtors, those who've sinned against us. So he's teaching us what he does. Forgiving those who keep repenting. So the notion that a man or a woman who claims to have repented will never sin again, or even the same sin again, cannot be true. Even Abraham, father of the faithful, wasn't it twice that he gave up his beautiful wife to the king's harem? Twice! I think so did, uh, was it Isaac? Isaac did that too, I think. But anyway, Abraham gave up his wife twice. Even super righteous Apostle Paul. Let's read it, in fact. Romans 7, verses 15 to 20. Note especially verse 15 and 19. For what I'm doing, I don't understand what I want to do or will to do. I don't practice. But what I hate, that's what I find myself doing, he says. If then I do, I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good, but now it's no longer I doing it, but the old me, the sin that dwells in me doing it. Okay, For I know that in me and my flesh nothing good dwells. For to will is present, but how to perform what's good I, I, I don't find. He says it again, verse 19, For the good I want to do, I will to do, I don't do. But the evil I will to do, that I practice. So please, many of you are feeling really rejected, abandoned, and horrible, abandoned by God, by people, because you've sinned again. Paul did too. But then he says, who's going to deliver me from this awful body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, as he was, who walk no longer after the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You know why there's no condemnation for you now if you're in Christ? Because you can't condemn Christ. His life is now your life. That's why he says, it's not me doing it. Verse 20, put it up again, Romans 7, verse 20. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. The new me, I've died. My life is Christ, Galatians 2, 20, right? 
a bit disappointing for Paul to admit that, you think? Or maybe in a weird way, reassuring that he was human too. We're rewarded by our works, saved by grace. As a way of life, though, the old ways of sin have to stop. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. The old ways of sin as a lifestyle. That's not what Paul was talking about. He says slip-ups. He was talking about slip-ups. He wasn't talking about him I'm out there committing adultery and murdering people. He did murder or help murder Stephen, some others probably. It says he put several of the Christians to death. So slip-ups and so on will still happen. But it shouldn't be a way, a way of life. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators. Some of you are living with someone you're not married to or having sex with someone you're not married to. That's fornication. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. Drunkards is in there. Extortioners. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh-oh. So who will be in the kingdom? Well, verse 11 says, Such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. So you're no longer a drunkard. You were washed and sanctified and justified, made right with God. Through, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So the way of life has to stop. We're no longer thieving, no longer stealing. We're no longer getting drunk on a regular basis. We're no longer doing these things. Fornication, adultery, and so on. As a way of life. And frankly, on the slip-ups, on those big stuff like that, that should, shouldn't be happening either. Such were some of you. We have to make our past our past. A past way of life. Such were some of you. Or we won't be in the kingdom of God. But just realize, even the righteous slip up. Even Paul did. Even righteous Lot. He's called righteous Lot in 2 Peter 2.7. Even righteous Lot who offered his daughters up to the mob outside his door. And then, I'm sure they were very depressed with five cities of the plain being vaporized. Maybe Zoar got, got off. Maybe it was four. But anyway, uh, anyway, he didn't want to be in Zoar. So he and his daughters end up in the, in the hills, in the mountains, in a cave. And he gets so drunk by his daughters, who thought everyone had been killed now, and that they had to continue the progeny of mankind. That was what they were thinking. And so he had sex with his daughters. And we got Moab and Ammon, I believe. We're Moab and Ammon out of those two daughters. Even righteous Lot did this. I'm sure he repented when he found out. Or else, why would he be called Righteous Lot? But he was called Righteous Lot. God doesn't spare the heroes of the Bible. Judah had sex with his daughter-in-law. Instead of giving her Shelah, uh, his, uh, you know, to be the, the husband. Anyway, there's a story there in Genesis 38, verses 11 to 26. I could go on and on forever with the reported sins of Samson, Gideon, all these men and women of the Bible, Aaron, Miriam, and Peter. Peter, even after conversion, after the Holy Spirit, Paul had to rebuke him in public for his hypocrisy in the way he treated Gentiles. In one, in, at least in one time. He was a hypocrite. Jacob, who became Israel, meaning prince of God or, or overcomer with God, okay, summarized his life this way to Pharaoh, he says, few and evil, Genesis 47, verses 8 to 9, when he went to Egypt, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And yet he's, he's going to, 
Israel? I mean, his sons even are going to have their names on the, what, on the gates, right? On the gates in the New Jerusalem? You have to go through Israel, right? So Prince, overcomer with God, says his life was evil. Oh, that all of us could be so honest. Why aren't we? We all still struggle with the carnal human nature. And that's why we still have to keep repenting. It doesn't mean you never did repent. Please understand that. And I hope ministers who teach that quit teaching it that way. Uh, the big, big stuff, I hope, does stay past. But boy, you know, our carnal nature is, has to get subdued. Our thoughts, our actions. So what happens is when we, I call it the constant contact program. I started this about five months ago. And the constant contact is 7, 10, 20 times a day. You're making contact with God, with Jesus, thanking him for everything around you, thanking him for the blessings, asking him to forgive you, asking him to come and be in your heart, in your life, come into my life, be my life, Jesus, please. And um, if you're being tempted uh, in a, to do bad things or to act badly or to be act terrible, or unkind, use those times to say, I, I really want to get back at so-and-so, and I know that's not the way you are. Please fill me with your spirit. Be my life, Jesus. Come into my life. When you're walking in the spirit like that, Galatians 5.16, you will not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh, and you'll find the carnal nature is much, much more subdued. It really does work. The moment, the half a day that you quit doing it, the other one starts to come back up again. And the battle begins again. Crush it. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. So in repentance, we confess, we acknowledge our sins to God. We ask him to wash them away in the blood of, our, of Christ. We ask him to be buried in baptism. And we ask Jesus to live more powerfully in us than he ever has before going forward. And we ask him to cleanse all of our sins and keep cleansing sins as we do them. And that he will atone for them, cleanse them, wash them, bury them. That's repentance. As we walk then in newness of life, turn to, towards God. When we repent, there's partying going on in heaven. Partying. Luke 13, Luke 15, Luke 15 verse 7. When the shepherd found his lost sheep, he was so happy. He called all his friends. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven, Luke 15, 7, over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who don't need to repent. Luke 15, verse 9 and 10, when she found it, this woman found this lost silver coin. She says, I found the piece that was lost. Come on, let's celebrate. Likewise, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Ezekiel 18, 23. Do I have any pleasure that the wicked should die, says Jehovah God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? There are people on this planet who don't allow a bad sinner to really repent, don't want them in his church, in their church. They don't believe they've really repented. And even if he did, we really don't care for that kind in our church. You know people like that. Please read 2 Corinthians 2. They had to, in 1 Corinthians 5, kick out someone who was a, uh, doing some very perverted things. And in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says, bring the poor man back. He's repented. Don't have him have over, overly sorrow, over much sorrow. We don't want Satan getting to him, bring him back. And then in chapter 7, he does talk about godly repentance. We'll cover that in part 2. I'm not ignoring it. Psalm 51, 2 Corinthians 7, we're going to cover it a lot in part 2. Now we're going to talk about what do we repent of. Most of you will immediately say sin. That's correct. But let me review what sin really is. It's far wider, maybe, than many of you realize. And then I'm going to give you a surprise one that I doubt everyone's doing. But to me, it's a huge point. A huge point, and maybe new to some of you. So, 1 John 3, 4, in the King James, it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, sins the transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness, is what most translations say. 
the contemporary English version, sin is the same as breaking God's law. Several translations say sin is disobedience. So when we disobey what God tells us to do, that's something we repent of. The Bible tells me to honor my wife in 1 Peter 3, I think verse 7. It tells me to honor her. And if I don't, I have to repent of that. The Bible tells you women to respect your husbands and submit to them. If you don't, repent of that. The Bible tells us to redeem the time. But if you find yourself spending hours on Facebook and social media, and you can, or on Netflix and watching stuff that... Is that redeeming the time? My point is, go beyond the Ten Commandments. Look at anything the Bible tells us to do. Paul says in Romans 7, verses 7 to 13, that he identified that he, that he was sinning when he coveted because God said, don't covet. So breaking God's law is sin. We repent of that. Second one, sin includes not doing the good you know to do. James 4, 17. He who knows to do good... And doesn't do it, does it not? To him it is sin. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. That brings up a few things, doesn't it? The new living, remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. James 4, 17, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him it's sin. Okay, that's another definition. You want more definitions of sin? Here's another one. Romans 14, 23. I'll read this one from the English Standard Version. Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not done from faith. Whatever doesn't proceed from faith, if you don't have the confidence that what you're about to say or do is right and you do it anyway, that is sin. God does not want us breaking our conscience, breaking our faith. So are you finding some more things to repent of? So in other words, if someone knows it's okay to drink wine and others are trying to convince him but he's a teetotaler he was raised baptist or whatever and he, he's never had a sip in his life and even though he can see the scriptures that yes it's okay to drink wine just don't get drunk on it if it's going to offend him and he can't do it in faith he shouldn't drink wine One more definition of sin before the really big one coming up. 1 John 5, 17. All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. So sometimes we, we, we get involved in something that isn't evil, but it's not righteous either. You're right on that line, maybe. That's probably going to end up in sin. Something to repent of. Other translations say all wrongdoing is sin. So all of us might be sinning more than we realize. Now let's move on to something I think is really huge, really big. Over the 30, 40 years I've preached it and tried to live it, it's, it's convicted me a lot. Maybe it'll convict you as well. It's a definition of sin that I think very few have seen or use. Instead of repenting of the sins, the things we did, the transgressions we committed, like lying, instead of getting on your knees and saying, Father, I lied. I can't believe I lied to my boss or lied to my wife or lied to the kids or whatever. It was just a little white lie no such thing. A lie is a lie. And you're repenting of this, that I lied. That's one level of repentance. It's much deeper, much more humble, much more, to admit, Father, forgive me, I lied because I am a liar. Just like what he said about Satan. That he's the father of lies. I hope I kept this in here, the verse about Satan. Maybe I didn't. That, that when he lies, he's speaking of his own nature, of his own way. Yeah, John 8, 44. You're of your father, the devil. John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. 
He was a murderer. He doesn't say he murdered. He was a murderer because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar. He is a liar and the father of it. It's very hard to say to people and to say to God, I am a liar. Can you forgive me for being a liar? There's something very purifying. This is putting bleach all over the cup, the inside of the cup, the ins our insides. This is really cleaning it all up when we say, I am a liar. We do the sins we do because that's what we are. Liars lie. Hot-tempered people lose their temper because they're, they're tempered because they're hot-tempered. That's what they are. Lustful people become adulterers in mind, if not in action, whether they end up in bed or not, because that's what adulterers do. Sinners sin. And when you can see and admit and confess and repent of what you are, you're at a much, much, much deeper level of repentance. And you've taken a huge step, I believe, to overcome it because you've just now admitted to what you need to overcome. You don't need to overcome lying so much as being a liar, which causes the lies. Remember also, we must not remain liars. And I don't think God sees liars as liars if we repent and put it behind us. Adulterers, put it behind us. Whatever the sin is, unspeakable sins, put it behind you. And when we have repented, we can put those in the past tense, as I read earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, such were some of you, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed, you were, what does it say, you were sanctified, you were justified in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, it goes on to say. Such were some of you. So I'm not saying you've got to feel like you're a liar the rest of your life or that you are whatever the sin is the rest of your life. Repent of it, knock it out, get rid of it, and move on. When we repent, it's really hard to confess to God or anyone, for example, to admit and say, I'm a cheat. I am a thief. If you are stealing time from your boss at work by being on the phone for an hour and a half when you can get away with it on your private calls. Is that not stealing? I had a good friend who mentioned that to me as, a, as something I should mention. When you can admit I'm a thief, it's very empowering actually to now you can do something. One of the first things you do when you I'm not an alcoholic, but I've never even attended an AA meeting, but I understand they go there, and the first thing they say is, I am, they give their name, I am John Doe, I'm John, I'm an alcoholic. They profess it, confess it. Now I've been sober, I guess they say that too, for however long, two days, two years, 20 years, whatever. It's really hard to say, I'm a gossip. Really hard. Remember counseling a woman one time about that for baptism. I said, I'm just curious. Are you a gossip? She says, no. Have you ever gossiped? Well, it's not like I'm always gossiping, but you sometimes do. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at her and said, I do. I do. I'm trying to completely put that away. So I, I, it is a way. I, I'm not a gossip today, but 40, 50 years ago, yeah. And so I had to get her to the point where she could admit that she could be a gossip and that she could do any sin, that she could do any sin under the toughest pressures. So remember to repent of what you are. Remember the story of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. I'll put the story in the notes in case you're not familiar with it. But a Pharisee and a publican went to the temple to pray. Back in those days, they had the, the, the best prayers were right there in the, in the temple area. I, they don't mean going into the Holy of Only the high priest could go in there once a year. But they mean in the temple's complex. 
God, I thank you I'm not like other men or like this publican right next to me, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I wonder if he ever fasts. You know, that kind of thing. Very bad, bad, bad way to pray. The tax collector standing afar off, verse 13, Luke 18, 13, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He doesn't list all his sins. He just says, I'm a sinner. I've done them all. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, that means made right with God, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's another one who repented of what he was. When you read the book of Job, Job throughout most of the book is explaining how good he was. I was an eye to the blind. I was legs to the lame. I helped poor people. I did this. I did that. You can't find anything wrong with me. I wish God would talk to me because when I would speak, I'm sure he'd take note. He says those things. He says he's righteous. Almost was saying he was more righteous than God. But in Job 40, God finally, I think in chapter 38, 39, God up in a whirlwind starts to really humble Job. And remember, he was covered with boils and everything. Probably hadn't eaten right. Probably was just skin and bones. Looked terrible. Had no energy. Jehovah answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God. Let him answer it. And Job answered Jehovah the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. Have you prayed that ever? Have you ever prayed that? When you deeply repent of something, how about copying that and just think about it, pray about it in your heart, mull it over, and then when you can feel it, say, God in heaven, I am vile. Chapter 42, Job answers Jovan and says, I know that you can do everything. No purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? If I can paraphrase what God was saying, today he'd say, Job, dumb. That was dumb, dumb, dumb. <laughs> who is he who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I've uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I didn't know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I'll question you and you will answer me. God, he says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. I've heard all about you. I've had sermons about what God is like. But now my eye sees you. I get it. Therefore, I can't stand myself. Therefore, I abhor myself. I repent. Dust and ashes. And I want to turn back to you. We don't repent of just sin. We repent of what caused the sin. You know who that was and what it was. It was you. It was what you are. So we repent of the self. I abhor myself. Father, forgive me a sinner. It would be very humbling if you would take me up and start repenting that way. And even when we confess to someone we've offended, yeah, just tell them. I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I did that. I'm just such a jerk. Please forgive me. We're not going to change what we are until we recognize what we are. Admit it. Say out loud what we are. Sometimes still are. God can't lie because it's not his nature to. He just can't. He must always speak truth. A mouse can't crow because crowing is not something mice do. It's not in their nature. You and I do these things because it's our nature to. So can you admit to being a thief? Do you always report your taxes correctly? Do you never take anything home from, from the office? Do you always check everything out? Everything. Double check it. Make sure you're not leaving a food store where you have self-checkout 
and walking out with something not paid for by you. When I counsel for baptism, I like to ask people a couple of things. One thing I ask them is, have, can you ever see yourself lying? How about committing adultery? How about ever murdering somebody? I get tougher and tougher as I go through that. And I'm trying to get people to see that under extreme pressures, the nicest woman could commit adultery. I'm thinking World War II and other times where soldiers said, if you don't do this with me, I'm going to kill your child right in front of you. I think God understands the pressures. Peter couldn't imagine ever denying Christ. But in his hearing, he does. And then he wept bitterly after doing it. Because under certain pressures, they, he could see what they were doing to him. They were scourging him. These Romans weren't beyond grabbing somebody else and do the scourging or even made to make him do the scourging. So, no, 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 no. I don't know him. He even swore an oath. I promise you, or whatever he said, I swear. I don't know this man. That's what it says. That he swore that he never knew him. In one of the accounts. So can you see yourself doing almost anything? Your upbringing might have been greater than most, keeping you from being tempted to do things others find easy to do, easy sins. But yeah, we can all do all kinds of things because of our nature. The second thing I ask, are you a gossip? Have you ever gossiped? We gossip because we are gossips. That includes listening. You don't have to always be the one telling the story. But if there was no one to tell the story to, gossiping would die. So when you listen, you're being part of it. About 40-some, 50 years ago, when I was new in the ministry, I remember talking to one of the elders in the church that ended up being, frankly, right on the edge of gossip. And when I came to a sentence, end, period, this elder changed the subject very abruptly. And I was convicted in my heart that he was better than I at that moment. He did not want to listen to gossip. He didn't say, I don't want to listen to gossip. He just changed the subject. I paused for a second. I vividly remember this. I grabbed his arm and I said, thank you. You changed the subject because you didn't like hearing what I was saying. Didn't need to hear what I was saying. I'll repent before God when I get a chance. And I ask your forgiveness as well. So gossiping includes hearing it. Change the subject. Walk away. And if you do find that you have been certain things, again, I'm going to say again, God doesn't see you. He sees you as a child of his now. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Such were some of you. If some things are from addictions, like alcohol, like drugs, like sex, addictions, beware of the addiction kind of life because you can easily slip back if you're not watching yourself very, very carefully. So an alcoholic must not have alcohol in the house. So be on dual alert not to slip back. And over time, you'll find you're getting stronger and stronger, and you're not. You're just not that way anymore. So be on full alert, though. The carnal nature and Satan is going to try to pull you down as much as he can. So you understand what I'm saying about repenting of what we are. When we come to repentance... We have to come to see that God has to give us a completely new nature. One we don't have before. He's not trying to rebuild our old carnal nature. He's not trying to make it better. 
by fixing it here and there. He wants to replace it with the life of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Christ, my life is hidden in Christ, in God. Colossians 3.3, 3, Paul said. Galatians 2.20, I no longer live. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I now live is by living by faith in Christ. It's his life. So that's what's got to happen next. I'll talk more about that in the next part two here. Our new nature is Jesus Christ becoming our life. It's Jesus himself and his perfection. And when we focus on that new life, let that be active in our lives. The impatiences, the lost tempers, the unkindness, the brutality the, in our voice and words, all of that gets modified a lot. Although Jesus himself was pretty blunt sometimes. You bunch of vipers and snakes, you know, so on. Hypocrites, he would call people. Pharisees especially. Now when God wants to make you and me completely new, it means liars now tell the truth. Hallelujah. Addicts, whether to drugs, sex, or being too tough on people and being a bully and whatever, whatever things that you were as your life, those things change. Christ changes you. Lustful people now become faithful people. They never intentionally hurt their wife or family or others again, or somebody else's wife or husband, by their sin. Because Jesus won't cause that much hurt by sinning. When we obey God, we're living the life that is showing love. He's now our life if we abide in him. That's the hard work we must do now. John 15, verses 1 to 5, or even verse 6, Abide in me, and, and you'll bear much fruit. And let him be in... Let him inside the latest scenes. Let him come inside. Come inside your home. Stay in constant contact with him. By that I mean 7, 10, 15, 20 times a day. I don't mean long prayers. I mean short prayers. I mean a minute or two. Besides your longer prayer in the morning and at night. Maybe, you know, David and Daniel prayed three times a day. There's even a verse that says, seven times I will praise you. Seven times a day. And so there's that, the constant contact concept, is certainly in the Bible. But you'll find that there's lots and lots of things to repent of. Where do you focus your time? Are you spending so much time on TV, on, on movies, on, on social media? God forbid we're spending any time in porn. And too many church men do, and some women do. That's feeding the old nature. No wonder you have trouble. We're replacing old sinful conduct with a new pattern of life and conduct. Remember what we said earlier, that repent means to turn back to God and to change, to convert, to be converted, which means we're also overcoming. I need to give a whole sermon just on overcoming sometimes. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And he says, Satan has no part in me, nothing in me. So we live a new pattern of life, not of sin, but of God's righteousness. Look at Ephesians 4, verses uh, 25 to 32. I'll start wrapping this up now. Give me another five minutes or so. When we turn to God, the things that we were, we find what would be the opposite of that, and we start doing that. Or those things. So in Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, this is what Paul is saying. Therefore put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. What's the opposite of stealing? Instead of taking from somebody, you'd be giving to someone. So you want, I want you to do this with every aspect of your life that you see as a problem. What would be the opposite of the problem? And start asking God to help you do the opposite. 
the righteous thing. Okay, let him who stole steal no longer, Ephesians 4, 28. But rather let him work, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So now instead of stealing from people, you're working and saving up some of what you earned to give and share to people. So this goes beyond the be warm, be filled concept you'll find in James 2, verses 15 to 17. He says, which of you has, has a neighbor or brother who has need of things, and you have those things, and all you say is, be warm, be filled, you'll be in my prayers tonight. He said, that's not faith. That's not living faith proven by works. So that he may have something to give him in time of need, uh, do give money. I have uh, on my Facebook, I have a little baby girl. Um, that's just covered with all kinds of things, medical things, in and out of her body, in a lot of terrible shape. And I'm not asking for prayer so much, although people should pray, of course. They need money. They need money to pay her medical bills. Please, get on my Facebook if, you're, if, if I'm on your friends list. Get on my Facebook and please, Share some of your money. Verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what's good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Instead of foul language, instead of F words, instead of swearing, instead of dirty bathroom words, we don't talk like that anymore. We now talk about things that edify people, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You see, you take the opposite. So whatever you're working on, take the opposite. What, if you're getting drunk, what's the opposite of, not, of, of getting drunk? Find out what that is, and then start doing that. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. We'll talk much more about the Holy Spirit as we come to Pentecost here soon. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away, all malice. What's the opposite of all that? The next verse, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you of everything, right? Forgave you. So I hope you're seeing what repentance is. I hope the idea of repenting of what we are, I hope the idea of taking the opposite of what our problems are the righteous opposite, doing that, like I've just been reading. I hope you understand again, we've been called to repentance. Rend the heart, not your garments, Joel 2. Return to me, call a fast, repent. And what repentance is, it's, it's turning back to God. It's not just saying you're sorry, it's that, plus walking back to God, being the prodigal son coming home. God leads us to repentance and gives us repentance. I've covered that too. God wants everyone to repent, not anyone to perish. And uh, lots of joy in heaven when you repent. And how we replace the old way with the righteous way now. Next time, please don't miss next time because it's going to be cool. Um, really good. Some feel, what's the use? My sins are so bad. Even if God forgave me, his people won't. They won't want me in church. Um... What does God say about people like that? And I, I, I you, you know, you, you don't want to miss that. Um, I think you'll find part two very inspiring, actually, especially those of you who are struggling with addictions. God wants to work, work with you and help you. You have great hope still of being in that kingdom. Godly sorrow, worldly sorrow. We'll talk about that. The joy of repentance, more about that. We'll diagnose Psalm 51. David's prayer of repentance when he murdered Uriah, which was the greater of the two sins. Bathsheba was temptation he gave, gave in to. Uriah was premeditated murder. That was the thing that really upset God. We'll cover how to make the divine nature the new spiritual creation, the new you. And we'll analyze Paul's statement that now when he sins, it's not him, but the old nature living in him, how we can avoid that happening. 
And then uh, I might even bring up Catholic penance. We don't do penance. We'll talk about that as well. I know some Catholics come here too, so. Bow your head with me, Father. In heaven, we come to you. Father, we, we're made of flesh and blood. Spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. You said that, Jesus. So help us, please, become stronger by having you in us. For he who is in us, that's you. It's greater than he who is in the world. Help us seek you. Help us admit what we are to you and confess. Help us really put what we really are that's negative and bad. Let us put it to rest. Let's get rid of it. Bury it. Wash it in your word, in baptism, in your blood. Help us repent, Father. Help us open the door to you like the latest scenes. You told them, open the door. We don't want you outside knocking. We want you here with us. We want to sit at your feet. We want to learn from you, Jesus. I pray you bless us now. Give us repentance. Give us forgiveness. And give us your Holy Spirit. We praise you. We thank you. We pray that you will be pleased with us, that you'll sh let your face shine upon us and bring us peace and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.